Uh, welcome everyone. I am Julianne Fritz. I'm the Research and Programs Coordinator here at the BAMP Sport Medicine uh, Foundation. We are, uh, for those that don't know us, we're a research and education uh, charity uh, and we work quite closely with the uh, physicians at the BAMP Sport Medicine uh, Clinic. Um, today it's a pleasure to welcome uh, our current fellow, Dr. Laura Michelle, uh, who will be uh, giving today's presentation. Uh, so Dr. Michelle pre previously completed um, her orthopedic surgery residency at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, followed by a fellowship in trauma at Dalhousie University in Fel uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, prior to joining us uh, here um, at Bath Sport Med. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we are recording the session uh, and then I will send uh, the link to the recording to everyone that's registered. So you will get that in a couple of days. Um, if you have questions, I just ask that maybe you put them in the chat. I will help monitor the chat. Um, and then we'll also have a bit of time for Q&A at the end as well. Um, and then at the very end, as we wrap up, uh, there will be a really short uh, survey that uh, will pop up on your screen. Uh, and I just ask that you take a couple of minutes just to uh, fill that out, just so we can get a f some feedback about future topics um, and things like that, that you might uh, like uh, to see from us. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Laura. Um, uh, welcome, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, so I'm Laura. Um, so my talk is on shoulder instability. Um, sorry, just trying to figure out how this, there we go. Um, so my objectives, we're first going to just talk about a generalized management and treatment of just shoulder instability, and then go into anterior, posterior, and then multidirectional instability. So as we know, um, the gonorrheal humeral joint is the most commonly traumatic dislocated joint. The incidence ranges from 11 to 23%, which is pretty wide. Um, and this is due to minimal bony restrictions, and that gives the gonorrheal humeral joint max mobility, but stability relies on the complex interplay between bony and soft tissue stabilizers of the shoulder. So diagnosis is what you usually start with. Uh, so on your history, you want to know your mechanism of injury, whether it's high versus a low in, uh, energy injury. You want the position of, of the upper arm at the time of injury. You want any previous instability events or was this their first dislocation? Um, what range of motion that that instability occurs in? And the activity level in sport and in work. So are they a high competitive athlete? Uh, do they do overhead activities for work? It's important to know. On physical exam, uh, we go through inspections. So you want to expect both shoulders, range of motion of both shoulders, uh, strength, including rotator cuff, and neurovascular testing. And then we go into special tests. So what are the special tests for shoulder instability? Um, Anteriorly, uh, for an anterior instability patient, you want to do an anterior apprehension. You want to do a relocation test. You want to do an anterior drawer test and a load and shift. Inferior, you might get the sulcus sign or do the gagey test. And posteriorly, there's the posterior apprehension, load and shift test, and then the Kim and jerk test. Uh, this is just a comprehensive review of all the... <laughs> instability physical exam test and their sensitivity and specificity as you see there's a wide range um for bait and score it's important to do in every patient um uh, just to find out the generalized ligament laxity uh, so it's a score out of nine and you test five things so your apprehension or sorry opposition of thumb to forearm and you get two points for one being the right and the left Extension of your fifth finger beyond 90 degrees. Again, two points left and right. Um, and then extension of your elbow and your knee beyond uh, 10 degrees, which is important. A lot, a lot of people just think some hyperextension gives you a point. It's actually beyond 10 degrees of hyperextension. And those are two points each. And then forward flexion of the trunk or palms touching the floor with straight legs. And that's a total out of nine. A load and shift test, um, 
measures the translation and how much translation anterior or posteriorly the gonohumeral joint has, and it's graded from one, two, and three. The apprehension and relocation test your can be done either supine or upright. The shoulder is abducted um, 90 degrees, and then you uh, fully externally rotate them. And then the pa patient may experience pain or most likely apprehension would be a positive test. And the relocation, you're applying a downward force on the anterior shoulder to reduce the apprehension. And that would be a positive test. Jerk test for posterior instability. The patient is sitting upright. Arm is in forward flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. And then you apply a posterior directive force along the humerus. This can cause a posterior translation of the head. And as the arm is brought into extension, a painful clunk can be appreciated as the humerus reduces. The Kim test, um, the patient is upright with the shoulder abducted and internally rotated um, and applying an axial load to the elbow, the arm is then elevated and a posterior directed force as the humerus causes it to translate. So you're looking for posterior and inferior instability and or pain with that. Um, oops. The gagey test is a sign of laxity, inferior capsule or inferior laxity measure of passive abduction, and it's greater than 10 degrees above the horizon, which will equal a laxity of your inferior capsule, as seen in the picture. Sulcus, so another sign of inferior instability, uh, testing your inferior capsule in your rotator uh, interval. So when you externally rotate your shoulder, you're putting the contents of your rotator interval on stretch. Therefore, if the sulcus sign is still persistent in uh, external rotation, you know there's a deficiency in your rotator interval, not just the inferior capsule. Move on to imaging. So your classic imaging that you get when a patient comes in is usually AP and lateral. But there's also called the Grashi, which is a perfect AP, and it's helpful to look at the sclerotic uh, anterior inferior rim of your glenoid to look for a bony bank out or any irregularities. You also want a third view. So ax axillary is usually hard to get in a, an acute patient. So you can try to get a Valpro view. And this just demonstrates um, a, hill, a large hill sac lesion. And here it demonstrates, a, as you can see, um, down below in the right-hand corner, you can see the, the uh, evulsion fracture of the glenoid or a bony bank guard. So these two imaging views are good for seeing either hill sacs or bank guard. So one in the right-hand bottom corner is a striker view. That's good for seeing hill, hill sacs. And a west point view is good for seeing a bank guard lesion. So moving on to advanced imaging, CT is the method of choice to evaluate bone loss, and it's very pivotal in decision-making, especially in terms of surgical decision-making. MRI is good for evaluating the labrum and rotator cuff. For CT, you want to look for glenoid and humeral head bone loss, the size and the orientation of the lesions. Fracture of the anterior glenoid rim, or also known as the bony bank guard lesion, is observed in about one-third of first-time dislocators and sometimes overlooked on an x-ray. Anterior instability. So this is the most con common form of shoulder instability, most often due to a traumatic injury with the shoulder in abduction and externally rotated. A traumatic instability can develop with ligamentous laxity patients or after repetitive micro trauma, such as overhead athletes. And these patients will present with anterior shoulder pain and a sensation of transient instability. Associated injuries. So with anterior instability, you can get a bank guard lesion, whether that is just the inferior anterior labrum or a bony bank guard, which is a piece of the glenoid that fractures with it. A um, humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament or Hagel lesion occurs in patients slightly older and those with bank art lesions. 
Uh, a GLAD lesion is a glenoid labral articular defect. It is a sheared off portion of articular cartilage along with the labrum. You can also get an ELPSA lesion in anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion. You can get fracture and a hip sax lesion. So this just demonstrates the mechanism of traumatic anterior dislocation. As you can see, there's a large posterior lateral head defect, which represents a hill sacs. And then the bank art lesion, you can either get tearing of the anterior inferior capsular labral injury or a piece of a glenoid avulsion fracture. So that's the bony bank art is a piece of bone that comes with it versus just the labrum, which is just a bank art lesion. Hill sacs lesion is a compression fracture on the posterior lateral humeral head created by impaction of the head onto the glenoid rim. And up to 90% of first time uh, dislocations, they're often small. And in recurrent dislocators, the prevalence and size is often greater. This just demonstrates associated injuries and in that it's usually a bipolar lesion, meaning that most patients have either small hill sacs and a glenoid um, injury, and that helps us with our management. So if the patient has a bipolar lesion, they need to determine their engagement. And this can be done by determining the contact area between the humerus and the glenoid. So if the hill sacs lesion engages into the glenoid rim, that is called an off-track lesion. If it does not engage, it's an on-track lesion. And this is one of the old ways of, with bone loss of less than 25% and um, on-track versus off-track. So you wanna take um, the glenoid defect as well as whether it's an on-track versus off-track into your surgical decision-making. You also want to do the instability severity index score, or also called ISIS. Uh, this is a score based on their risk of reoccurrence. And the factors that are in it are age, so whether they're less than or greater than 20, the degree of sports uh, participation that's preoperatively, so whether they're a competitive athlete versus recreational or none type of sport preoperatively, whether they're contact or a forced overhead, uh, shoulder hyperlaxity, hill sacs on the AP, and uh, what other, whether there's glenoid loss of the contour on the AP. So if an ISIS score of less than three, they have a small risk of recurrence, less than 5% chance, usually an arthroscopic repair uh, may be beneficial. ISIS between three and six is in the gray zone and is up to 10% recurrence, but an ISIS score of over six has a 70% recurrence and sometimes uh, requires an open repair. So non-surgical management, um, immobilization for three to 10 days. We don't want them uh, immobilized for too, too long. And then you want early rehabilitation to achieve full pain-free range of motion. Return to sport is usually within seven to 21 days, depending on their sport. So surgical management, there's a lot of options. Um, it depends on humeral head and glenoid deficits, as well as how much um, bone loss on the glenoid and whether the hill sacs is engaging or not. And then you go through your surgical management. So you have to remember that anterior shoulder instability is a bipolar problem. And that's, so you have to look at both the humerus and the glenoid. More recent studies show that actually the most more significant bone loss or greater uh, bone loss on the glenoid is actually around 13.5. So between zero and 13.5% glenoid bone loss um, is usually an arthroscopic repair. Um, and then 13.5 to 25 is actually in the gray zone. So they want you to add something or complement your arthroscopic um, repair, whether that's with a capsular shift, a remplissage, or you can go straight to the latter J. And then over 25% over glenoid bone loss, they 
prefer the latter day procedure, which is a open procedure with a bone block. And again, you need to take in consideration whether it's an on-track versus off-track hill stack lesion. Post-operative rehab, uh, the first six weeks, first three to six weeks, uh, depending if it's open versus arthroscopically, um, of immobilization in a sling. Rehabilitation starts with passive and then active assistant range of motion with physiotherapy. After about four to six weeks, they can start initiating strengthening exercise program, focusing on your rotator cuff and scapula uh, stabilizers, and then return to work and sport is around four to six months, depending on what they do for work and sport. So overall, careful patient selection is key to a favorable outcome for traumatic anterior shoulder instability. After a first time anterior shoulder dislocation, non-surgical treatment with a short period of immobilization is recommended. Primary shoulder stabilization should be considered, though, for patients with high risk of recurrence or for elite athletes. And the amount of glenal bone loss and type of bone loss, whether it's an on-track versus an off-track lesion, are important factors when recommending treatment strategies. Now, posterior instability. Uh, posterior so posterior instability is posterior translation of your humeral head relative to the glenoid. It's often can be from a small subluxation to an overt dislocation. The range is less than um, anterior instability. It's about 2 to 10% and more likely to be misdiagnosed or a delay in diagnosis as a result of nonspecific symptoms such as pain and weakness rather than gross instability. So posterior instability versus anterior instability, the most important thing to remember is the clinical presentation. So this was a study done, match cohort examining both anterior and posterior and they're presenting sy symptoms and pain being 88% in the posterior, which is far outweighs uh, a dislocation event or instability symptoms. So pain is your is your key, especially posterior pain for a posterior dislocation. So history of posterior instability, classic picture of repetitive microtrauma or posterior directed force, such as weightlifters or a line man. Uh, less commonly acute posterior uh, shoulder dislocations are seizure, electrocautery or electrocution, sorry, and a dashboard injury. So history of posterior instability, you want to get your images, and classically, your image would be the light bulb sign on x-ray, and that gives you a hint that there is a posterior dislocation. Associated lesions of posterior instability, um, so you can get an avulsion of your posterior band of your inferior glenohumeral ligament, you get a posterior bank art lesion. Um, a reverse hill sacs lesion. You can also get posterior labral cysts, which is representative or associated with more with a chronic lesion. Uh, posterior glenoidal rem fracture, a lesser tuberosity fracture, and a large capsular pouch, also associated with chronic posterior instability. And again, just going over a special test, Posterior apprehension, load and shift, Kim and jerk test are the uh, posterior instability tests. So treatment, initially managed conservatively. Um, so activity modification, sling, physical therapy to improve scapular um, thoracic uh, mechanics and strengthening of dynamic shoulder stabilizers. Risk factors for recurrent instability, for posterior instability, their first dislocation before age 40, whether it was a seizure, seizure that uh, provoked the instability event, a large reverse hill sacs lesion or glenoidal retroversion. So abnormal anatomy, and usually that retroversion uh, should be, um, the risk factor would be greater than 10 degrees. Uh, this was, I believe, a Canadian study so non-operative management of posterior shoulder instability and what are the long-term clinical outcomes? So posterior uh, shoulder instability managed non-operatively had only an 8% um, chance of 
rate of reoccurrent instability and 8% rate of progression to osteoarthritis. Um, however, they found that 46% of patients demonstrated an improvement in pain, 35 while only 35 had the same level of pain. So they concluded that non-op management is a viable treatment option for many patients with posterior uh, instability, um, although those presenting with pain are less likely to have a significant improvement in pain long-term. This is just an algorithm for um, isolated posterior instability. You want to look at their examination, are they quite unstable? And then you look and see, do, again, do they have posterior glenoid bone loss? And if they don't, or if it's less than 10% chance, you might get away with an arthroscopic labral repair. Um, and then greater than 20, you may need a bony procedure done. So a bony block and that being done open. This also just gives another different view of an algorithm, but essentially surgery goes from a labral repair to application versus a labral repair and reverse remplissage versus a posterior bone block. If those fail or if their glino defect is greater than 10% or a retroversion of 10 to 25%. Post-op protocol. They're usually often placed in a sling. You want them immobilized four to six weeks. Um, and then work on passive range of motion and active assistant range of motion with physiotherapy. Strengthening typically begins three months postoperatively and return to sport or work four to six months postoperatively. Multidirectional instability characterized by generalized instability of the shoulder in at least two planes of motion due to capsular redundancy. Diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis and it's presence of increased anterior and posterior humeral translation, a sulcus sign and overall increase in external rotation. It often peaks in your second and third decade. And mechanisms either micro trauma from overuse, so seen in overhead throwing athletes, volleyball players, swimmers and gymnasts, or generalized ligamentous laxity associated with a connective tissue disorder such as Marfan's or Elan Danlos. Hallmark findings, you get a very large inferior capsule on MRI. Therefore, MRI arthrogram is often needed to assess the volume of this capsule and then rotator interval deficiency. Treatment, initial treatment is non-operative with rehab focusing on proprioception exercises, scapular thoracic training and dynamic stability, and this often minimum of six months of aggressive physiotherapy. Surgery can be uh, indicated in patients with persistent symptoms despite appropriate physiotherapy of greater than six months. And inferior capsule shift or arthroscopic placation are currently the most favored techniques if you were to pr proceed with surgical in intervention. And I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. I do have some uh, questions that have popped into the chat. Okay. Um, so I'll go through those ones first. Um, so first question for you. Um, after a first time dislocation, what symptoms should an AT or PT be aware of as indicating the need for a surgical consult? Uh, well, you want to give them at least three months of physiotherapy um, in a first time dislocator. Um, and then persistent symptoms, it depends. Uh, so ongoing instability, so subluxation, does it come out when they're sleeping? Um, can they not get back or return to work or sport is another one. And due to the feeling or apprehension of instability, um, a big one is pain, posterior, uh, shoulder pain for a posterior instability event. Um, and if they've had any recurrent dislocations as if physio may not be helping them and they do need something surgically done. Awesome. Um, and next question, um, are some of the special tests more sensitive for diagnosing anterior or posterior instability? Um, yeah, if I go back to that 
slide. I think Kim's test is the best for posterior, but anterior, I believe, is the um, apprehension and relocation, which kind of go hand in hand. Um, and then do some risk factors indicate the need for sooner surgery? Um, they can be, yeah, especially if they have tried physiotherapy and um, just not getting anywhere with conservative management and they do have the high risk factors, yes. And if they're a high competitive athlete um, with high risk factors, you may just go on to surgery. Okay, when you're referring to risk, those high risk factors, you're referring to all of them or are there just specific ones other than being a competitive athlete? You just go through the ISIS score. So their age, their how competitive their sport is. Do they have any bony involvement from their dislocation? Um, and yes. <laughs> or my cat is. No, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> uh, two, uh, a couple more questions. Um, first one uh is pain usually from the bony injuries or soft tissues do we know that i think it'd be from both um but for some reason anterior instability you get that gross instability or apprehension whereas posterior instability the most common symptom is just pain and they'll point posteriorly to it again that doesn't follow every person every patient but that's majority. Okay, awesome. I um, have another question here that came through the chat. Um, what modality of imaging uh, should you pursue for rec recurrent anterior instability? I've seen MRI, CT, and also bilateral CTs, and then all three. Would be interested in what to pursue as the first imaging modality in someone who's a good surgical candidate. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, for your question. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think CT is the most valuable, uh, especially in recurrent instability, because it, it takes a look at both the glenoid and the humor, the sorry, the humeral head. And it takes a look at how big that hill sacs lesion is. It also gives the orientation of where that hill sacs lesion might be. It also takes uh, into account how big the um the glenoid rim fracture is. And that helps us with surgical management in terms of thinking what what surgery we would do. So I would say CT over an MRI, and also MRIs are a little harder to get in Canada. I think maybe some of our American colleagues might get both, but I know MRI, there's a long wait list for it. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Um, any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself too if you don't want to type into the chat. Either way is fine. Um, if anyone else has any other questions. Oh yeah, and so Chris just followed up with your answer. Um, it sounds like an MRI, MRI really needs to be for the initial referral. Um, and that sounds correct, yeah. Uh, anyone, any other questions out there? Oh, okay. Yeah, one question. Another question. Um, when is the latter J uh, needed? So latter J is needed. Let me find it. Let me see if I can find that slide. When you have a significant bone loss on the glenoid rim, so traditionally it was around between 20 and 25% loss of, glen of the glenoid bone loss. However, recent studies have showed that there may be a more significant uh, bone loss, meaning that gray zone between 13.5% and 20% or 25% um, may need a bony procedure. And then you have to take in consideration whether it's an on-track versus an off-track lesion. And if it's an off-track lesion, you need to decide whether you 
do add a raw plissage and an arthroscopic uh, label repair. And that's dependent on how much bone loss there is as well. So the greater the bone loss, the more need that you need a ladder J. Um, and also in revision. So in a revision case, if you've done a labor repair prior and they are a recurrent dislocator, um, the next step would go to a more bony procedure. As yeah, so you typically J. recommend it uh, for a revision where there's significant bony, bony loss. Pardon? Uh, uh, primarily recommended for more significant bony loss and for revisions. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Oh, yeah, we have another one. Um, are there any factors, um, we as in the audience, um, which are mainly uh, PTs and some strength and conditioning coaches, uh, from what I can see. So sorry, uh, they're just the ones I know of. Um, so are there any factors we can consider for prevention of shoulder instability injuries, such as ratio of internal to external rotation strength, T-spine, range of motion restrictions, or movement pattern deficiencies? Um, I would just think generalized stability of your rotator cuff and your periscapular muscles and just being well conditioned. Um, high traumatic event we're not going to prevent, but in the low injury or multi-directional instability, we can help prevent with good conditioning. Awesome. And then Chelsea just followed up with a thank you. Thanks, Laura. No problem. Um, any other questions out there? Or Dr. Michelle? No, it looks, yeah, it looks like that is it so far. So thank you everyone for um, attending and thank you, Laura, as well.